Okay, today we're going to be learning Beitza Daf Lamed Hey. Uh, remind everyone to register for the Seum. Registration is up. You can find it on the homepage. There's a link right to it. Um, so please register. Only a few more days left to go till the end of the Masecha. We'll be starting the last chapter today. So Sunday, again, notice it's a bit of a different time than it usually is. It's 7 p.m. Israel time. So figure out wherever you are, what time it is. Right, Eastern time, for example, at 12, British time, 5 in the afternoon. Um, so I hope you're all joining. And um, we are going to get started. Okay, right. We have a usual interesting lineup. Um, and also there's a Hebrew one an hour and a half after that, which is why we changed the time. So if anyone wants to join the Hebrew one at 830, you can join that one as well. Okay. We are going to start at, I'm actually going to go back to the end of La Medalla and Amabet. Okay. Um, this week's learning is sponsored by Eliana Gorfinkel, in memory of her grandmother, Alice Jamila Ventura Bat Moshe and Leah, who passed away this December. She never had a chance to learn about her Jewish, Jewish roots, not even talking about Torah. Um, I'm sure that in the Olam HaEmet, she's delighted that her granddaughters learned Torah and do mitzvot in her honor. Her neshama should have an aliyah. And today's staff is sponsored for Fuashlema for Chaya Sarah Bat Raitza. Um, okay, we're going to start, uh, as I said at the end, actually, we'll go back and do a quick summary of. Um, I, sorry, did I do something wrong with the Seum? It's 12 hours later. I missed something. I see something in the chat. Oh, I see. 12 hours later than our normal class. Okay. So if we go back to the Mishnah, the Odom Arabelezer, remember Arabelezer said you could stand by the Muktzah on Erev Shabbat, that part on the roof, and say the words, I'm going to take from here tomorrow. The rabbi said that's not enough. You have to actually mark off the area. You can't just say in general. And that was because of Brayer, and we're not going to get into all that right now. But you can do it as long as it's Erev Shabbat on the Shnat Tashmita. And then, even though the fruits weren't really ready yet, Right? They were still not fully dried out. Since you said, I plan to eat here, they're already right, ready for you. You can eat them. Then we brought this whole issue of Maser. Right? It specifically talks about Shvi'it. So from there we got into why Shvi'it, because Shvi'it, there's no Chiyuv of Maser. So because of that, <clears throat> we're going to say that Mar Rav Rava asked Rav Nachman the following question. Shabbat, we learn because you say you're going to eat something on Shabbat or because you eat something on Shabbat, that turns it into any sort of sudat aray, becomes a sudat kep, any sort of right unofficial, <clears throat> unofficial meal, snack, right? Normally, if things, right, if things are still in the field, if you haven't gotten to the stage where you're actually obligated to master and you want to snack on something, you can. But not on Shabbat, because Shabbat itself determines that now you're being serious about these. And now, even though... Right now, the whole question became, well, what if it's not Gemar Malacha? Is Shabbat Kovea even if they're not really ready yet? So they say in the courtyard, right, it doesn't determine the fact that I brought something into a courtyard. If I plan to dry them, I'm not obligated to master yet, even though bringing them into the courtyard normally determines this is obligated to master. So Rava asked Rav Nachman, would it be the same about Shabbat? Would we also say about Shabbat that Shabbat is not does not determine that you're chayav and masir if it's not actually ready yet. To which Rav Nachman says, no, Shabbat does determine. If you say, I plan to eat this on Shabbat, that already is enough to say, right, now you're obligated in masir, even after Shabbat, right? So that even if you didn't eat them on Shabbat, after Shabbat, you're going to have to because the, the chayav of masir hit, you know, started. As soon as you say, I'm going to eat a meal from this on Shabbat, it started. To which Marzutra says, and then Rabbi says, why do you say that? And Rabbi, Rabbi, says, Rabbi says, because I say that, right? I have a tradition. But now, I'm sorry, Rav Nachman said, Marzutra now tries to prove it from our mission. And we were up to the part where the Gemara says, you can't really prove it from our mission. So I'm just going to go back to that because the end part, I want to explain a little better than I did yesterday. So Marzutra says, we can derive it from our mission. Why? Because our mission was exactly that. You stood on Shabbat. You said, I plan to eat these. And because, in other words, again, the Mishnah wasn't talking about Maser, but it was referencing it because it said specifically on the Shnat Shemitah, if it wasn't Shnat Shemitah, you would have to take the, the Maschot. And therefore, you wouldn't be allowed to because you already, the Chiyav would kick in. So can't you prove it from there? Isn't the whole reason of the Mishnah because Shabbat is Kovah? To which the Gemara said, no, no, no. It's not Shabbat that's Kovah. It's that you said, I plan to eat these. 
If you say I plan to eat them, you're basically saying these are ripe, these are ready, these are ready for me. Okay, so it was your so we basically are rejecting Marzutra. I want you to keep this in mind because we're going to go back and forth with this today. You're basically saying it's not that it was Shabbat that determined that you plan to eat them on Shabbat. It was that you plan to eat them in general. So then the Gemara said, well, if it was you plan to eat them in general, and you basically say, if I say I'm going to eat these, I'm basically showing that these are ready enough for me. And then that's Gemara Malacha. If that's the case, then why does the Mishnah specifically use the example of Shabbat? And this is a line that's a little tricky. And I want to review it again because I didn't explain it well enough yesterday. And also it's going to come up again in today's stuff. You say, why does it say not? And this is the very end of Lama Dal and Amabet. It's to teach you this halacha. The tevel is muhanu etzel Shabbat. Okay, this we explain well, which is the reason it shows Shabbat specifically was to teach you this halach that if that if you have fruit before Shabbat that you didn't take truman masra, right? I brought in some lemons from my tree and I didn't maestro them before Shabbat. Are they muktza? No, they're not muktza. What's the relevance if they're not muktza? Well, the point is that if someone were to take truman masra on Shabbat against the law, right? Against rabbinic law they would actually be, I could eat them, okay? Because they're not mukta. The tricky part, that's easy to understand. The tricky part is how does he derive that from her mission? That's what he's basically coming and saying is, the reason our mission took a, 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 an example of Erev Shabbat and Shnach Shemitah when you're not Chayv and Maser was to teach you something that if it was Chayv and Maser, now here it's tricky, because if it was Chayv and Maser, it would seem like this wouldn't work. But what they're trying to say, okay, now here's where it's tricky and there's, Debate among the commentaries exactly. The commentaries struggled with how to understand this as well. What one of the exam, one of the reasons given is it doesn't say in the mission of the language of Hareza Mina Muchan. If it had said Hareza Mina Muchan, then we would derive that only Arab Shabbat Shvi'it is this Muchan, is this not Muktza. But because it doesn't use the language of Muktza, and it talks about are you allowed to eat it? Are you not allowed to eat it? But it doesn't actually relate to is it Muktza, is it not Muktza, shows that even if it wasn't Shnach Mitah and you be Chayi Maser, it wouldn't be Muktza either. Okay? It's a little bit of a jump. It's not so clear cut. But that's the answer they give, that even though this halacha would really apply on a weekday, because it has nothing to do with the fact that it's Shabbat, which was what we were trying to prove, Marzutra was trying to prove from here, to prove Rav Nachman. No, it doesn't have to do with Shabbat. It has to do with, he said the words, Mikana Niocha. Okay, from here I plan to eat. That already determines Gemar Malacha. Okay, that you... For you, it's as if this Gemar Malacha, that overrides the fact that it, it isn't actually completely ready. At this point, it's Chayv and Masko. That's what we're up to right now. And then as an aside, why did it talk about Shabbat Shemitah? I was trying to teach you some other Halacha, that even if it wasn't Shemitah, again, it's weird because it's not what it was talking about. It was specifically talking about Shabbat Shemitah. Even if it wasn't Shabbat Shemitah, it actually wouldn't be a Muqsa problem. It would be a separate issue, but it wouldn't be a Muqsa problem. You wouldn't be able to eat it because you'd have to meister it, but it wouldn't be Muqsa because... Right, and if it had used the language of muktzah, you would have known it was a muktzah issue as well. But it's not a muktzah issue. Okay, now the Gemara says, but wait, if you want to say right now, where are we up to? Marzutra tried to prove Rav Nachman. Rav Na- okay, let's start again. Rav Nachman said Shabbat kovat lemaser even without Gemara Malacha. We're going to keep returning to this all day today, or at least for the beginning of today's stuff. That means again, I want to make sure it's very clear. That means if you plan to eat something on Shabbat. That already means that this is something that's obligated in Masert. You have to take the tithe, the produce, even if it's not fully ready for eating. Okay, that is right, more important almost. And that you can't learn from the Mishnah because really, what was the issue in the Mishnah? The Mishnah was because you said, from here I'm eating tomorrow. So because you said, from here I'm eating, that's what determined. So now they say, wait, if that's what determines, and then what happens according to that? All this produce needs to be masered. If it wasn't, again, it's, it's what's not said in the Mishnah, which is the Mishnah was talking about a year where you don't have to take masro. But implied is if you did have to take masro, it would be obligated in masro just by you saying, from here I'm, I plan to eat. So now, according to this, let's say we're assuming that I have a lot of fruits drying on the roof and I only take some, right? That was all machlok at Rabbi Lezer and the rabbis. Do I, can I take some, right? And, and the rabbis said, no, you have to designate exactly which ones. Rabbi Lezer said, you don't have to designate. So the assumption is that Rabbi Lezer thinks that as soon as I say, I'm going to take from here, I've determined that all these are basically ready enough for me. 
in which case I have to take Maaser on all of them. However, that's going to contradict something Rabbi Lazar says somewhere else, because the assumption is I'm only going to eat some of them on Shabbat and then whatever's left, right? Again, we'll still be obligated in Maaser. I just wasn't planning to eat it on Shabbat. So it says here, Bahalom Motaro Chose. Right. What's going to happen in this case? Whatever I leave over is going to go back to being on the roof, right? And it's going to continue to dry out. And, and the assumption is that it's going to be anyway, though, obligated in Maser right now, even though it's not Gmar Malacha, because I determined that for me, this is enough. But wait, we heard that Rebbe Lezer said somewhere else, if you take some out of a group, right? And then you have leftover and you don't eat them all, they can go back into the original pile and you don't have to take Trumona Maschot from them if there's not Kmar Malacha. And that's going to contradict what we're claiming he says here. Okay, again, if we're saying that all that determines is his decision to eat them and not that it's Shabbat, right? Not that it has to do with anything have to do with Shabbat because that was all, we rejected Marzutra in saying that this has to do with Shabbat. And then we said the only thing about Shabbat was to teach you some side issue about Tevel being Minamuchan. But, the real issue here is he said, I plan to eat from here. Now, if he said, I plan to eat from here, we say everything now has to be tied, even the stuff he doesn't eat. But that contradicts what Rabbi Lezer says elsewhere. Let's see. Ditznan, it says in the Mishnah, okay, olives, they would put after they harvested them, they would put them in a vat. There they would soften, get moist, and it would be easier to take the oil out of them. They're clearly not ready at this point. So there's no gumar malacha. But if I take a few olives out of the vat, I can take one by one, dip it in salt and eat without tithing the produce because clearly this is not Kamar Malacha. However, we talked about yesterday, right? What does it mean? Where do we draw the lines? So they draw a very clear line. One to nine olives is a rye. 10 olives is keva. So if I take out 10 olives, okay, I already have to take maser on them. Here comes Rabbi Leezer. Rabbi Leezer, and we won't fully understand this for the next minute or two. Min ha-ma'atan tahol, chayav, if I take it out from a pure vat, I will be obligated like Tanakama said. But min ha-ma'atan tamei patul, but if I take it out from an impure vat, then I'll be exempt. I see some jokes going around about is it a minion, but really I actually think, I don't know, I didn't look this up, but I assume ma'aser is a tenth. So once you have 10, then a 10th would make sense to take a 10th. Any less than that doesn't sound very serious. I'm guessing, but I'm not sure. So Rabbi Lezer says the following. He distinguishes between whether the vat was pure or impure. What does that have to do with anything? So he says, if it's impure, then you're exempt from maser on whatever you didn't eat. Why? Because, or the truth is on all of them is exempt. Why? Because you're going to end up we're assuming if you took 10 out, you're not really planning to eat 10. You just took like a big handful. But you're going to put back whatever's extra. So the Gemara, and then what's the assumption here? Forgetting about why there's exactly a differentiation between Tamei and Tahol. The point is, since you're going to put them back, when you put them back, they'll no longer be obligated in Maser. So that goes against what he says here, because I'm only taking X percent from what's on my roof. Whatever's left, according, since I said I plan to eat from here, that's his it kind of overrides the fact that there's no Gmar Malacha yet. And all of them become obligated in master, even though I'm leaving over, let's say 80% of the, of whatever's, or it doesn't really matter what percentage, but I'm leaving over X percent on my roof. So that would be the same as the olives going back into the vat, which are not obligated in master. And they ask, what's the difference between whether the vat is pure or the vat is impure? What does that have to do with anything? So Amar Rabbi Avau, Rabbi Avau says the case is Reisha b'Matan Tavol v'Gavra Tamei. The first case is the vat is pure, and I am Tamei. The person who's taking the olives out is impure. Dilo Matzei Mahadarle. If if the vat is pure and I'm holding impure grapes, I can't put them back. Uh, olives, I can't put them back in because it's a pure vat. I don't want to mess it up by putting impure things back into the vat. So therefore, there's no chance I'm going to put anything back in. So if I took 10, I'm going to eat 10. But um, the vat is impure and I'm impure. In that case, since I could potentially put them back in, and then again, if I put them back in, they won't be obligated in Maser. 
That's the difference. So again, what do you see from here? Well, the laser holds. If I put something back in, right, whatever's left over, so to speak, is not obligated in Maser. And that's not the way when we tried to reject Marzutra's explanation, say it was Shabbat that was important. Say, no, 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 it's not Shabbat that determined. It was the fact that I said I plan to eat from here, but I'm leaving over a ton. And according to this explanation, we said all of it's obligated in Maser. So what did they answer? Oh, you could just say, you could say the Mishnah is referring to a case where the Muktza area was pure, the person was Tame, and therefore there's no chance he's going to return whichever ones he doesn't plan to eat. And then you could say, oh, that's why all of it's obligated in Master because there's no chance he's returning it. But that's a ridiculous assumption because this isn't like I went into a vat, took them out of the vat, and I'm putting it back. This is, there's a big area and I'm going to take a few from there. I'm not even touching the rest of them. I have nothing to do with the rest of them. They're clearly going to be there still. So in which case they say it can't be. Okay, now where are we up to? Again, let's go back to the beginning. Rav Nachman said Shabbat kovat lemaser. It determines that you're chayav and maser if I want to eat something on Shabbat, even if it's not yet ready for eating. The fact that I said I'm going to eat this on Shabbat is already enough. And then even after Shabbat, I'll have to take the Truman Maschot from. We tried to, Marzutra tried to prove it from our Mishnah. We said, no, no, no. The reason that our Mishnah has nothing to do with that, it has to do with because you said, I'm going to eat from here. And that's why Rabbi Leezer, remember, it's Rabbi Leezer and the Mishnah. That's why he says, you can eat there because you said, I'm going to eat from here. But you can only eat it if it's Shvid and not a day where you're not obligated. If you're obligated in Maser, then you're going to be obligated in Maser. Presumably, he means not just on the ones Right. You've determined it's Gmar Malacha for you. So basically you're going to be obligated on all of them. But that doesn't match what he says here about the olives, where whatever's left is not obligated in Maser. And here it is. In which case, it can't be that it's him indicating I want to eat this is what determines. What must be the determining factor? Because again, we're going to compare. Our Mishnah, he says, I plan to eat. You take the olives out of the vat. You say, I'm planning to eat. Whatever's left is not obligated Maser on the olives, and whatever's left here is obligated Maser, according to the way we've understood the Mishnah. In which case, we reject the rejection against Marzutra, and we're back to square one, or certain square. We're back to Marzutra claiming that the issue in the Mishnah must be Shabbat and not what he said, because he said, I plan to eat these. And it wouldn't be true on a regular day. It wouldn't make all the things in the Muksa obligated Maser, because that doesn't match. Rabbi Lezer's own opinion, whatever's left, he wouldn't think is. Maybe it would determine that what he took is, but not the rest. And therefore, we're going to say now or the, right, that it must be Shabbat Kobat Lamaser, and therefore Marzutra can prove Rabbi Nachman from the mission. That's what we're up to. But Rav, Rav Shimi Barashi is now going to reject Marzutra for a different reason. Ella Amar Rav Shimi Barashi, Rabbi Lezer Kamart, wait. You're trying to prove this general question from Rabbi Eliezer? You want to say that, does Shabbat koveh lemaser, even when there's not Gemara Malacha, right? Does Shabbat mean Shabbat? I determine I'm going to eat something. I say I'm going to eat something on Shabbat. That means this produce is now all going to be obligated maser, not just whatever I eat, but all of the rest of it. In other words, right, again, when it's a regular day, no, but on Shabbat it will. And that's what determined that all the fruits in this muksa now need maser. Again, it's not directly what the Mishnah said, but it was implied from the Mishnah. If you're going to say that, and then you want to teach us that in general, Shabbat kovat the maser, even B'Shein and you're going to learn it from Rabbi Le'ezer. But wait, you can't learn it from Rabbi Le'ezer. He's a unique opinion. The rabbis disagree with him and other similar things. We're going to see right now. Rabbi Eliezer Lita'ame, he has a generally unique approach when it comes to when are you obligated Maser. Okay, we're going to see. In a, he has a unique approach in a case where there isn't Kamar Malacha, where your food is not ready, and yet you do something that shows, I'm right, I'm serious about this, I, I'm ready to use this, or you do something like I'm planning to eat it on Shabbat. That for him, he thinks yes, but he's unique in his approach, and we're going to show you why. So here's another case. He says, Truma kava'a, because can Shabbat. He claims that if I decided I took my fruits that weren't ripe yet, or produce, whatever it is, 
And I started taking, remember there's Truma Gadola, the part that goes to the Kohen, the 150th or 40th, 160th. Then there's Maser, comes after that. If I took Truma Gadola from, and I gave it to the Kohen, the Maser goes to the lady. If I took Truma Gadola from this produce that wasn't ripe or ready yet in any way, but I did that, according to Rabbi Lezer, then I have to take Maser. I can't nibble anymore, a snack at all. I can't do any of that. Because at this point, it's Chayv and Maser. So if he says it by Truma, well, the more so is going to say it by Shabbat. But the rabbis disagree with him about Truma, and therefore we can assume the rabbis also disagree with him about Shabbat. In which case, if your whole proof, Marzutra, is based on Rabbi Lezer and our Mishnah, we're going to throw you out the window because Rabbi Lezer can't be used as proof for a general question because the rabbis disagree with him. And we always hold by majority. So here's our proof about the Truma. It's not. Perot Shetchaman, Ad Shalom Igmaram Alachtav, so if you took truma before Gmar Malacha, here it's very simply stated, right in the Mishnah, Rabbi Lezer says you can't any more snack from that produce, but the rabbis allow it because he says truma kova the masil. Okay, so fine. Again, go back to our structure. Just I'm going to keep reminding you because otherwise, otherwise it will be a confusing page. Rav Nachman was asked by Rava to Shabbat Right, eating a meal on Shabbat does that determine that this produce has gemar malacha? Right, is it it overrides the gemar malacha necessity for maser, and now you have to tithe all the produce or not? Rav Nachman said yes. Marzutra tried to prove it from our Mishnah, from our Beliezer. It was unsuccessful. We tried to reject him for some reason. In the end, we said no, no, no. Really, Rav Eliezer thinks it's Shabbat that's kovet, and not your statement. That is true, but we reject it because that's only Rav Eliezer's opinion, and the rabbis disagree. So now the Gemara has a better proof. Tashmami Seifa. So let's learn it from the rabbi's position in the mission. What does it say? And here we're going to have a very similar structure to the end of yesterday's daf. The Chachamim Omrim, Ad Shir Shom V'yomar Mikam V'adkan. The rabbis don't disagree with Rabbi Lezer in principle about the halacha. You can determine that I'm going to use these and they're now going to be obligated in Maser because what do the rabbis say? It's just a matter of how do you do it? Do you, can you just say, I'm going to take from here generally? And by Brera, we're going to say, well, whatever you take is what you were, what you had determined before. Or do the rabbis say you have to designate an area, mark it off? So the rabbis say you have to mark it off. Okay. Again, what do we assume from our Mishnah? Right? Tama de Erev Shabbat Shvi'it. The reason why, if you designated it before, you're allowed to eat it on Shabbat is because. It was a shnat shmita where you didn't have to take the true and Again, we're going to have the same, right? But ha b'shar shnei shavua, one can derive from the Mishnah that any other year, that if it was a regular year, that produce would be forbidden. Why? My taima, we're going to assume again, lav mishum de Shabbat kava. Is it not because you determined you were going to eat this on Shabbat? That already kicks in your chiv, your obligation to tie the produce kicks in right then, even though they're not really ripe yet, okay? Or they're not dry, they have, they're have ripe, they're just not dried out and you wanted them dried. So again, it's the parallel to what we did with Rabbi Leazar. Still, we can infer the same thing. To which the Gemara says, lo, shane hatam da'bar mi kavad kanani ochala machal, kavale. No, it has nothing to do with Shabbat. It has to do with his statement. He said, I'm going to eat this exact area. The statement I'm going to eat is what determines the obligation and not Shabbat, to which the Gemara is going to ask, just like they did yesterday. So if so, what's the difference of Shabbat? Even on a weekday, this should have determined that you're obligated in Maser. So why did the mission specifically choose Shabbat? Again, we're going to answer. Ah, the reason it chose Shabbat Shvi'it was to teach you this other halacha, that if it wasn't Shemitah, right, that it didn't say min amuchan, which means it's not a muktzah issue, even if it's not shnat Shvi'it, it wouldn't be muktza. It would just be forbidden to eat if you don't tie the produce. If you happen to tie it, it actually would be fixed and you'd actually be able to eat it. And that is, again, derived somehow from our mission, not in the most clear way, but that's why it uses Shabbat, in which case we, can, we can't prove from the rabbi's opinion, because it's not clear. Is it Shabbat that determined it, or is it his statement that he said, I plan to eat from here tomorrow, okay? And he designated the area. So we don't have proof from there either, okay? But 
even though we don't have proof from there, we did conclude, according to Marzutra, right, Marzutra's explanation or the way, is that you could fear from Rabbi Eliezer, you would assume that it's true, we can't prove from the rabbis and we can't prove Rav Nachman's answer because he answered generally. However, according to Rabbi Eliezer, it is clear that Shabbat Kovat Lamaser, because remember we said, you can't give the explanation we just gave a minute ago that we gave to the rabbis, that it was his statement, because if it was his statement, remember all the extra, what was left over, according to Rabbi Lezer himself, wouldn't be. And that, and we assume that he meant everything becomes obligated in tithe. So therefore it must be, it's Shabbat and not his statement, okay, that I plan to eat from here. And it wouldn't be true on a Yom Chol, it would only be true on Shabbat. The Shabbat determines, if I say I want to eat something on Shabbat, that means all this produce now has to be my ser. I can no longer eat it, even Motzei Shabbat, right? Because I've determined that this is overridden the fact that it's not um, that it's not ready. Okay, that is going to contradict the following halacha. So again, it's very confusing where we're going because we rejected using Rabbi Eliezer as a proof in general, but he himself clearly holds that way. That's what we concluded in the end. Okay, as opposed to the end of yesterday's talk where we thought not, we ended up proving today that yes, he really does hold a Shabbat that determines it. So now we're going to contradict, we're going to find a source that Rabbi Eliezer seems to say it's not true. Shabbat doesn't determine that you're high of and that you're obligated to tithe the produce. Okay, and then we're going to say, how does this work with what we just explained? Urimin he is a contradiction from the following bright. Haya ochel be'eshkol. Okay, you were eating, actually, it's a Mishnah. You were eating grapes. So you're snacking on your grapes outside in the fields or in your garden. And you walk from there into your courtyard. Okay, normally, right, we have a backyard, okay, which is really like a garden, I guess. They had a garden and a courtyard. So it was going, moving it into the courtyard that determines that you're going to be liable or you're going to be obligated to take on, not liable, you're going to be obligated to tie the produce. So if you're eating and while you're nibbling on your snack, you walk into your courtyard, you cross that line where you're obligated. So Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Yigmor, he said, look, you already started eating. You can continue eating. Rabbi Yoshua Omer, lo Yigmor. This isn't yet connected. Rabbi Yoshua says, no, you have to stop because you've now crossed the line where now you're obligated to tithe the produce. Second case, you're snacking on Arab Shabbos right before Shabbos. And again, we're talking about something that wasn't finished yet, right? So you're snacking on this food. Rabbi Lezor, Omer, Yigmor, Shabbat comes in, you can finish eating. Forget about the issue that you're not supposed to eat before Kiddush and whatever, right? We're not addressing that issue here. Clearly that he didn't think that was an issue. Um, he says you can continue to eat. Rabbi Yoshua, Omer, Lo Yigmor. Now what happens if Rabbi Lezor says you can continue to eat? Well, now you're eating on Shabbat. Anything you eat on Shabbat becomes keva. You need to do the Truman Amasro. So how can you, how can you possibly say this? Right? We said that Rabbi Eliezer claims Shabbat overrides this issue that, oh, it's not ready yet. Right? So what did they answer? Hatam I know there there's a bright that explains the reason. It says, Rabbi Natan Omer, Lok Shama Rabbi Eliezer Yigmo, Bachatzer Yigmo. You misunderstood what he said. When he said, you can finish it, when you cross the line into the courtyard, you can continue eating. No, 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 that's not what he said. You started eating and snacking and you crossed the line into the courtyard. You can't eat in the courtyard without taking the maser, but you can walk back into your garden and you can eat it there. Okay, just because you cross the line doesn't mean you can't go back, okay? Normally, right, we don't hold this way. You get, you brought into your house, it's, you're obligated. But, right, that's Rabbi Yoshua. But Rabbi Eliezer says, no, you can. You can go back across the line to where it's permitted. Now let's go to Shabbat. When he said you can continue eating, he didn't mean, now this resolves our issue of, what do you mean, he was eating before Kiddush? No, he didn't mean you can continue eating on Shabbat. He meant you can continue eating that after Shabbat. Don't eat it on Shabbat. If you eat it on Shabbat, then you determine this is a meal, right? This is keva. You're going to be obligated. But if you don't 
eat it at all on Shabbat. It's just you were eating it as Shabbat was coming in. You stop. The fact that Shabbat comes in doesn't, right, doesn't mean anything, okay? You can now, after Shabbat, basically continue eating these as you were eating them before without having to tie them. This is different than before where we said the payroll and the muksa all become obligated in Shabbat. That's because I've determined I was going to eat this on Shabbat. These were never determined you were going to eat them on Shabbat. You were just eating them as Shabbat started. So I assume, I didn't really look this up. I assume that Rabbi Yoshua thinks since you were eating them as Shabbat was starting, it was kind of like as if Shabbat determined and you wouldn't be able to continue after. Okay, so you can, so that's what he says. And then in which case, it doesn't contradict because it has nothing to do with anyone eating anything on Shabbat. He wasn't eating it on Shabbat. Okay. That was a kind of aside, as contradiction of Rabbi Lez. So again, going back to our beginning, Rava asked Rav Nachman, if, Shab- if I'm determining I'm going to eat something, if I say I'm going to eat something on Shabbat, even if it's not fully ready for eating, right? What are we going to say? The fact that I said I'm going to eat on Shabbat now makes all this produce obligated to tithe. That answer Rav Nachman gives, which we tried to prove from Marzucha, Marzucha tried to prove it from Rabbi Lezer and our Mishnah, wasn't successful because we said that's just Rabbi Lezer's opinion, not the rabbis. Then we tried to prove it from Chachamim. We couldn't prove it from Chachamim either. Then we brought this contradiction to Rabbi Lezer against himself. Okay, again, we ended up without a proof for it. Ki ata Ravin, when Ravin came from Israel, remember, he was one of the people called Nechute. They would go down from Israel to Babylonia and bring the Torah of Israel to Babylonia. He said, I'm a Rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan. He said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan against Rav Nachman. He had a different tradition from Rabbi Yochanan. Echad Shabbat, ve'echad Tchuma, ve'echad Chatzer, ve'echad Mekach. Okay, these four things. Shabbat, right? Being, saying, I'm going to eat a meal on Shabbat of these foods. Taking Truma Gedola from it, which we saw before was a machlok at Rabbi Lezer and the rabbis. Bringing it into your courtyard, which we also talked about before. And one last one that we haven't discussed yet purchasing it, those four things, kulan and kovin, these do not obligate you to take trumot amaschot. Only if they're fully ready. If they're not fully ready, none of these actions are significant. So this, certainly the one about Shabbat, goes against what Rav Nachman said, okay? Because Rav Nachman said exactly the opposite of this. So he says otherwise. Now we're going to have a very easy structure. Okay, the beginning of the daf was a little complicated. This is much simpler. We're now going to go one by one to the four things he said. And in each one, other than one that's going to veer a little bit different, a little bit in the beginning of it, we're going to say he says this against the following opinion. We're going to bring an opinion that he disagrees with that basically said other than he did. So with Rabbi Lazar, we already know that one, right? We're going to say Truma is to say, I don't agree with Rabbi Lazar, who says that Truma is Kovat Lamase, right? So we're now going to go one by one and see who, dis- who does he disagree with. Like he's trying to say, I don't agree with the following Tana. He's an Amora, right? And he's saying there's a Tana Idik Machaloket about all these things. And I agree with that side and not that side. So here goes. Shabbat la fuke mi dehila. Now, it's actually funny because he could say Shabbat, I disagree with Rabbi Lazar because we already determined that Rabbi Lazar and our Mishnah must be coming to say that Shabbat Kovat Lamaseh, right? Even if there's no Gmar Malacha. And he says, right, I think it's not Kovah. I don't think you're obligated to tithe it. So we could have said, Lafu came into Rabbi Leazar. So why did he say Hillel? We're going to read Hillel in a minute. One reason is Hillel preceded Rabbi Leazar. So you're going to use the earlier Emor, uh, Hatana if possible. The second answer is to say, he's saying, we just proved that Rabbi Leazar holds that, but he didn't say it explicitly. It was a, it was an, we got to there. It was actually kind of complicated to get there, right? It wasn't so clear cut. So maybe because of that, he doesn't say Rabbi Leazar. But anyway, he says, It shouldn't be liktsor, it should be liktsoa, which is to dry out or liktsor, just to dry them out. If you have a pile of produce and you want to move it to a different place to dry them out there, which means what? I don't think they're ripe now, but they're ready, even though they are ripe fruits, but I plan to dry them. That was our whole case of the muktza, right? They were clearly ripe. They just were there to dry. So at this point, they're not ready for use. So what does it say here? V'kidesh alehem ayom, and Shabbat comes in, right? V'kidesh alehem ayom, Shabbat comes in, which means if Shabbat comes in, right? And it's, um, and... I want to eat them on Shabbat, right? Am I allowed to? So again, 
if Shabbat kovat lemaaseh, even though there's no Gemara Malacha, then no. If Shabbat is not kovat lemaaseh, only when there's Gemara Malacha, and here there's not Gemara Malacha, then theoretically I can eat them. So what do you see here? Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Hilal atzmo ose. Hilal himself forbids, but the rabbis disagree with him. So here you see Rabbi Yochanan is coming to say, you actually can eat them because you're not obligated to master just because you decide you want to eat them on Shabbat. You can snack on them on Shabbat, no problem. Why? Again, Shabbat, normally you can't snack on things. It's keva, but only if the food is ready. This food wasn't ready because you brought it in to dry out. You didn't want it. Again, this is very interesting. I didn't get into this, but the fact that you plan to dry it, that means this is not ready anymore. Even though now you're eating it in its, in its raw form or its, its moist form. So that's just a whole interesting thing in and of itself, which we've talked about many times, your intent, how much your intent plays a role. Chatzer, in the courtyard, if you bring figs into your, field, into your courtyard to dry them out, again, what will you say? If the courtyard determines, even if there's not marmalacha, then it's going to be forbidden until you might stare them. If it's if chatzir doesn't determine, which is what Rabbi Yochanan says, chatzir only determines your chiyuv and maaser if they're ripe, like your lemons you bring into your house, they're ready to go. But if you're planning to dry them out, then no. So here it says, So it says here, they can eat, they're exempt from maaser, and it says there, Rabbi Yaakov mechayev Rabbi Yossi Rabbi Yehuda Potel. So it says there's actually a machloket in the, in the Mishnah. It just says simply you can do it. The Brayta says there's a debate about this. Rabbi Yaakov obligates you because he thinks chatzer, even though Gemar Malachet doesn't matter, you're obligated. And that's what Rabbi Yochanan was coming to disagree with Rabbi, Yochan, with Rabbi Yaakov. Say, I don't hold like him. I hold like Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, who accepts. Truma, this one's easy. We saw it already. La fu kemi Rabbi Le'ezer. Right, if you took truma before Gmar Malacha, Rabbi Lezer says, you're obligated. And to that, Rabbi Yoch, and um, the rabbis say not. You don't have to tie them yet because it's not Gmar Malacha. The fact that you took truma doesn't determine, and that's exactly what Rabbi Yochanan said. Here's the one that veers a little from the structure. Mekach, first we're going to prove his point, then we're going to say who he disagrees with. Kidetanya, it says Kidetanya, it should be Kidetanya, it says in a Braita. Halokech te'ini me'ama aretz. Okay, we're going to learn a few other things here also. If you buy figs from an ama aretz, now aretz were people who were somewhat suspect, I'll say somewhat because we'll see, somewhat suspect that they didn't take trumot amasrot. If you buy figs from an ama aretz, b'makom shero b'nei adam dorsim, if you live in a place, and here it's not your intent, it's what the majority of people do. Most of the people buy figs to dry them out and then press them into these fig cakes that we've seen many times in the Kamara or in the Mishnah also. Okay, the first line is more important right now for our purposes. You can eat them aray at this point because there's no Gemara Malacha and the fact that you purchase them doesn't mean that they're now obligated in Masa. You might've thought transfer of ownership, that would obligate you. No, only if there's Gemara Malacha. That exactly matches what Rabbi Yochanan said. However, there's this weird line here, which is, you actually do have to take maaser though, out of suffix, out of a doubt, because we're not sure. Now, even though it's a little counterintuitive, even though they weren't obligated in maaser before he sold them to you, there is this assumption when it comes to a chaver, which is the opposite of an amar. Someone who's careful about truma maaser will never sell anything in the shuk, even if it's even if it was figs that you plan to dry out, that most people dry them out, they would never sell anything they didn't take truma maaser from. There's an assumption. If I own a field and I keep halacha of these kind of halachot, then I, there's an assumption that I clearly took true on a maslow, even if I wasn't really obligated in them yet. Okay, there's this assumption. Ama'aretz, we don't really know. That's the thing. Maybe they did also. Maybe the same thing holds true for them. We just don't know. So therefore, I actually do have to master them out of a suffix. That's demai. I'm not sure if he did it or not. So even though theoretically we're saying you're not actually obligated to master at this stage, but then when you do master them, they might have actually, even though you weren't obligated to master, when you are obligated to master it eventually, because you bought it from an Amar Aretz, there's still a doubt here. It's not for sure that he didn't take the Trumon Amas for it earlier. That's just an aside to which the Gemara says, by the way, Shmami Natalak, before we get back to our, our main point, you can learn from here three things from this Brita. Shmami Na, number one, which was our point. Mekach ena kovat ela b'davar shen gmar malachta. That's, that, that I, the fact that I purchased it doesn't mean I'm now obligated to tithe it, doesn't kick in unless it's actually ready. 
You can assume here, right? You can infer from here that actually, since it's only demai, it's only a suffix, you can assume really most ameyaaretz really do take maasel. And you learn from here, though, even though most of them do take maaser, if it wasn't marmalacha, right, you still have to be maaser, the demai, right? Sorry, say it this way. You still have to be maaser, the produce, even if loaning marmalacha, because you have to worry that maybe he didn't do it either. Anyway, back to our main point. La fuke mehaditnan. And this is to, again, why did Rabbi Yochan have to point this out? Because there was another Tanaitic opinion. He wanted to make sure you didn't hold by that one. Hamachlif perot im chabero. If we do a barter, okay, instead of buying for money, I give you my food, you give me your food. Either both of us plan to eat it right away, which means this gmar malacha, or meaning neither has gmar malacha because both of us plan to try it. Or or if one of us got the fruits from one to dry to eat them and the other one got them to dry out, either which way you're going to be obligated because why? That's the opinion that Rabbi Yochanan is going against. Once you purchase it, it doesn't matter if there's gemar malacha. Your purchase says, I'm now the owner, I have to take, I have to tie them now. Can't snack anymore on them. Rabbi Yudah Omer, lecho chayav, liksot patul, only if there's Gemara Malacha, basically, and that's what Rabbi Yochanan, hold, uh, Rabbi Yochanan holds by. And with that, Hadron Allah Hamehi. We're now going to start the last chapter of Beitza. Mishilin Perot Der Harubabi Yom We're going to get into all this language. What is Mishilin? But we're going to explain right now. It means you can lower your fruits. The main topic of this chapter is, again, things that might cause Zulzu Yom Tov that look like not exactly the most appropriate thing to do, not in the spirit of Yantif. And then we're going to get to Tchum Shabbat. Okay, so, you have your fruits out on the roof and it's going to rain. You're, we want to allow you to bring them in because otherwise it's all going to get ruined. So you can lower it. You can't take them, pack them up in a box and carry them down your ladder. That's already not appropriate, but you can lower them through this window or shoot like a sun roof that you have, um, a window there. This is permitted on Yantif, not Shabbat. Note that the next line doesn't talk all about Yom Tov or Shabbat. And there's a debate, is this only on Yom Tov or also on Shabbat? If there's something leaking onto your fruits, you can put vessels on top to protect them. Or to protect your jugs. So again, it doesn't say they're Shabbat or Yom Tov, So there's a debate among the commentaries. What this is, is it only on Yom Tov or both? If you have a leak, you can put a pot underneath or some sort of vessel to catch all the water that's dripping to prevent damage. Itma. So there it says, even on Shabbat, you can do that one. So now there's a whole debate about the language in the Mishnah. There were clearly different versions of the Mishnah going around. Rav Yehuda v'Rav Natan. Chad tane mishilin, chad tane mashchilin. One says mishilin, one says mashchilin. Both are possible. And now we're going to show the etymology of each of these words by quoting something that uses those words that shows what it is. Sometimes it'll be a pasuk, sometimes it'll be a, a, a mishnah, a brayta, something like that. There's a pasuk from, from Dvarim, when, when your olives fall. So here you have this idea of going down. All of them are going to have to do with somehow going down. This is in Chulin. It's about trefas. Shachul is that it's an animal whose whose calf fell off. Okay, the the yerech of the animal, the leg fell off. It kind of got dislocated. I would say is a better word. So here, what's dislocated? It again downward motion. The other one that they mentioned here, not, per, not for our purposes, but one leg is higher than the other. So we had two versions. Now we're going to say, There's now three other possible words. First of all, Reish and Lamed switch often in different languages, right? There's a whole thing linguistically with, you know, the L and the R sound. So here you could see why they got confused between the L and the R. Is it Mishilim or Mishirim? And then it got to Mishirim, Mashirim, like Mashirim, and not also Manshirim. So Man Detani Mishirim, Lom Shabesh, Ditznan, right? They're all possibly options. 
Mishirim, here we're going to see in a Mishnah, Rabbi Shmuel Omer Nazir Le'yachuf Rosho Ba'adama, don't shampoo if you're a Nazir, your hair with Adama, with dirt from the ground. We talked about this the other day, that if you put it on the animal, it'll cause the hairs to fall off. It's a depilatory. Um, it works as a depilatory. Because it makes your hair fall out and you're a Nazir, you can't cut your hair. So here you see Mishirim is hair falling out. So falling again. This is either the scissors of the hair cutter or is a is a razor. So again, it's something that takes something down. Okay, so those they come in parts and yet each part works separately also. So if they break into two, it's not considered broken, that it's not a plea, that it won't be susceptible to impurity, but each part is kind of separate. And therefore, even if it's separated, they're each functional as that, and therefore can be susceptible to impurity. We saw this before. If your clothes get drenched with water on Shabbat, you could still walk in them because you don't have to worry. Someone's going to think you laundered your clothes. Okay, you got soaked in the rain. You can walk in wet clothes. So now they want to ask the following question. With this, we'll finish for today. Oh, sorry. One more before we go on. Sorry. One other thing. What is leket? We also see manshirim is something that falls. Leket is, right, this is what you're supposed to leave for the poor. It's something that falls while you're harvesting your crop. Now it says, Is there a limit on how many fruits you can bring in? Right? Because maybe then that's already so much work. So, Either Rabbi Asi said it, Rabbi Zera, Rabbi Yochanan said it. He learns it from a mission in Shabbat. If you remember, there was a parak called Parak Mifanin. It started with the Salacha. If you have in your storage house, you want to use your storage house either for guests or for a bait, set up a bait midrash because there's no room in the bait midrash. You can take out four or five you know, uh, boxes of straw, okay, or, or grains or whatever it is, that's how much you could take out. So we're going to assume it's the same thing here. So now the Gemara rejects this on a few counts. Maybe we'll be more strict on Yantif, maybe we'll be more strict on Shabbat, we'll see. Three different maybes. Maybe there we permit it, because it's going to cause people not to learn. But this is just a financial loss. Maybe not, maybe we won't allow so much. Inami, alternatively, you could say, Shabbat is more strict. And therefore, we're not worried if we allow you to schlep some heavy things. People are going to say, oh, we could do anything on Shabbat. Aval, right, here's the counterintuitive. Aval Yom Tov, to kill, since Yom Tov is more lenient. There's more of a concern that people will be disrespectful if we allow you to do that. Maybe you'll come to do other things. Therefore, we're definitely not going to allow this. Now, it sounds like we're not going to allow this at all. What do you mean? The Mishra said you can't. means you're not going to allow it in a big way, meaning four or five boxes worth is way too much. So both of those were ways to say Yantav is more strict than Shabbos, either because of Yantav itself is to be more strict or because there's no Beetle Bait Midrash, it's just a financial loss. The other one's going to say, so let's go the other way. Let's be more lenient on Yantav and let more. Why? Hatam, the actual opposite of what we said before. There's no financial loss here uh, in the case on Shabbat. Here it's a huge financial loss. We're going to permit more. So there you're going to take the same thing. There was only a financial loss, not be too bit Midrash. Here we're going to say financial loss actually maybe is considered more serious and we're going to even allow more for financial loss than Yom Tov. Okay, so we'll end with that and we will continue more um, on this topic tomorrow. Have a great day, everyone.